Hare Krishna Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances. Oh, this is your prophet. Welcome devotees to morning Bhagavatam class. This morning, we are fortunate and blessed to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami with us. And Maharaj will be speaking on the glories of Sri Padmanabha Acharya. Today being the disappearance day of Sri Padmanabha Acharya. And without further delay, Maharaj, we will hand the time over to you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Please accept our humble obeisances. All glories to you and all glories to Sri Prabhupada. I hope. <clears throat> Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyan Arjuna Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Prima Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Krishna Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nevisthe Sasunya Bhadi Pastyatya Devi Satarine Vancha kalpa taru vishya kripa sindhu vyeva cha patitana antarane vyo vaishnave vyo namaha namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Siva Sarigor Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare uh, Is the audio okay? Is it coming through? Clear? Very clear, Maharaj. Very clear. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's been a series of great personalities appearing. We started with Advaita Charya on Monday, and then Bhishma Dev disappeared. Yesterday was Madhvacharya. Today we'll be speaking on one of the greatest and most revolutionary of all acharyas ever to come to the uh, continent of South India, or you might even say uh, to the earth planet, Sri Ramanuja Acharya. Um, his birth name was Ilaya Ilyao, Ilyao, Il, 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 Ilaya. Layal Paramo. And um, he is actually a very empowered personality. He is actually, as it's his name indicates, Ramanuja Charya uh, means uh, Ramanuja means the younger brother of Ram. So actually he is an an energy of Lakshman who has come to revolutionize the teachings of spiritual life by bringing in personalism when throughout the continent of India at that time, and personalism, especially Mayavadism was quite strong. After Buddhism has been was driven out by Sankaracharya, which fled to different countries such as Tibet, China, Japan, and other places. Most, most of South India and parts of the northern areas became bastions for Sankaracharya's teachings. And it was very strong around that time. But the Lord had a plan, and so he sent one very powerful personality to help bring back the true teachings of Vaishnavism in relationship to the absolute truth as being the personality of Godhead. And personal, impersonal aspect is a feature of the absolute truth Vedanti tat 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 vidyats tat gyaj gyaj avayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaneti subjate that the absolute truth contains for three aspects within itself, although it is only one. It is Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. And so the impersonalists they focus on the imper they focus on the Brahman aspect of the absolute truth as being the supreme aspect of spiritual attainment. 
but they also personalize things for the sake of worship. But these personalisms that they invent or copy actually are simply there to feature the principle of worship. And they think they are dispensable once worship has reached a point of perfection. But we understand that impersonal I mean, is the feature of the Lord's all pervading energy. And this is effulgent that pervades the entire creation coming from the spiritual world. <laughs> and so Ramanujacharya was very instrumental in bringing back personalism. He um, was born in the year 1017. And he lived for, let's see, he lived for actually quite a number of years. And during that time, he really revolutionized the whole teachings of Vedanta. He lived, he lived for actually 120 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually celebrated his 1000th anniversary appearance in the year 2017. There was ceremonies all over India, paralleling this personality. <clears throat> he revitalized Indian philosophy. He was a social reformer so many things and I'll, uh, although the time is very short and the material that is available is very voluminous, I'll get to some of the more important aspects of his life which help for us to understand deeper the practice of Krishna consciousness. His Guru Maharaj was Ramanujacharya. And later, of course, Ramanujacharya established the, he was one of them, to fortify and establish Sri Lakshmi Sampradaya. There are four main Sampradayas, as mentioned. Lakshmi Sampradaya, the Madhvagodhya Sampradaya, which we are, Brahma Madhvagodhya Sampradaya, Rudra Sampradaya, and Kumara Sampradaya, or Nimbarka. These are the four sampradayas, and it says that if one wants to practice devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you can only find those teachings within one of these four sampradayas. And so uh, Jamunacharya, he was a very powerful acharya. His life is also worth interesting to uh, delineate. And uh, he was a king before he became a great Acharya, but after giving that up, having been born in a very spiritually uh, arranged situation, he now went to kingly life because he was granted that position in a defeat against another uh, scholar. But then after some time becoming disgusted with that, he went back to spiritual life. Ramanu, Yajimunacharya had three desires that he wanted fulfilled. And at that time, he had many disciples, but he knew there was only one disciple who he could, who would could fulfill his wishes, and that was Ramanujacharya. So it's described, um, of course, uh, Ramanujacharya had uh, not only Yamunacharya as his guru, his, uh, his official initiation guru was Mahapurna, and he also took a Shiksha guru from Gosti Purna. We can speak about them also. <clears> he <throat> was the embodiment of all humility and all transcendental knowledge. Yamunacharya, he was getting old, and he actually came to the time where he was leaving his body. It was a ceremony, and yes, right after that, he departed. His body was on display for those to take darshan. So many of his disciples and followers were coming. During the time, 
had many, uh, he was laying there, his, his body was there, obviously he had left. Uh, the devotees noticed that his hand was in a particular pose where three of his fingers were raised up. Hmm. And then everybody was wondering, why is his fingers in these posts? This wasn't like that when his body was brought there. But then Ramanujacharya was there. He says he has three wishes that were unfulfilled. And no one was really aware of those three wishes except Ramanujacharya. And so, no, actually his thing, his hand was clenched in a fist. That's right. He, his hand was clenched in a fist. And then that was said that he has three wishes. Okay. So Ramanujacharya, knowing, spoke, he said, to spread the message of Lord Narayan everywhere. And when he spoke that, one of the fingers in that clenched fist appeared. Then he said he also wants a Vedanta a commentary written on Vedanta Sutra to establish Lord Vishnu as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, defeating all Mayavadi and Brahmavadi philosophy. When he spoke that, the second finger opened from the fist. And then he said, to honor uh, the father of Vyasadeva, Parasaramuni, and to name a disciple after him. And then the third finger opened. After Jamunacharya left, the disciples encouraged him to take charge of the mission. Um, as he was taking charge of the mission, he started to preach extensively. And this was worrying some of the Mayavadis at that time. Um, he had such allegiance from many of his disciples. There was one Brahmana who would always, always beg for service. And he would come after lunch each day and uh, give a foot bath to Ramanujacharya. But one day Ramanujacharya did not return. And then he waited late into the evening for Ramanujacharya to return. And then he offered his service. Uh, Yagyamurti, famous Mayavadi scholar, everywhere he would go, he would defeat people. He carried a large cart of books. He challenged Ramanujacharya. He said, he said, well, actually, I don't even want to debate you. You accept defeat? Yes, then. Uh, Yagyamurti said, then you must teach Mayavadi philosophy. And then Ramanujacharya said, then we must debate. And they debated for 18 days and there was a stalemate. There was no one coming out. One day Ramanujacharya was thinking, how can I defeat this Mayavadi? He is so expert at speaking very and according to scriptures and twisting the meanings of the scriptures around in such a way as to fortify his ideas. So one day Ramanujacharya prayed to his deity, whose name was Devaraj. And then next day when he appeared for the debate, he became so effulgent that when Yagyamurti saw him, there was no debate. He simply surrendered at his lotus feet and became his disciple. There's a beautiful story which illustrates the importance of Vaishnav Seva. 
in the Ramanuja Sampradaya, Ramanuja taught Vaishnav Seva as one of his main principles. He also taught that bhakti is superior than karma and jnana. But the, the Ramanujis or the Sri Sampradaya, they are very inclined to serve Vaishnavas. We had the good fortune to associate with them in the year 2005 and 6, December, January, and again in 2010 and 11, December, January. And uh, my personal experience was just to watch how eager they are to serve Vaishnavas. They are always uh, in that mood of serving Vaishnavas, doing things for Vaishnavas. I remember just two Brahmanas came up to me and they gave me a gift. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, this is very nice. I don't even know them, but they just wanted to give us a gift. So we, we were there with about 5,000 devotees. That was in the year uh, 2005. Uh, no, no, we didn't have 5,000 devotees, but we had many devotees, <laughs> I think a couple thousand, 3,000. And um, they gave me a present, I opened it up, and it was two very beautiful, nicely strung Brahmin threads that were of high quality. So I remember keeping those Brahmin threads for many, many, many years. And so this was an example of how they like to serve Vaishnavas just arbitrarily or just, just coming up and offering gifts to devotees. Uh, Ramanujacharya was traveling with some of his disciples. He came to one town where he had two disciples. One was very rich. His name was, his name was uh, Yogesh. And he had another one, the, the disciple, whose name was Bhardaraj Acharya. So um, he said to his uh, brahmacharis, go to the house of Yogesh and tell him that your, your spiritual master will be coming in the evening. Have, ask him to have prasadam ready. Oh, fine. So he, they went. They came to the house of Yogesh. He opened the door. He was so happy to see his god brothers, welcomed them in, sat them down, and he asked them, why have you come? Well, Guru Maharaj is in town, and we are come to notify you that he would like to come tonight to your home to, offer, to honor Prashadam. So please make all arrangements. Upon hearing that, he completely absorbed himself. He was starting to call his servants and getting this ready, go buy this, do this. And in his enthusiasm, he completely forgot to speak any further or even give any kind of real welcome to the two brahmacharis. He was so enthusiastic to arrange for his spiritual master. And so the two brahmacharis just left. When they went back to Ramanujachari, he asked, did you inform him? Yes. How did he respond? Oh, he was very enthusiastic to, uh, to make all arrangements. You know, he was very, he was doing so many things when we, after we told him. Well, Ramanujit said, well, how did he treat you? Well, because he was so enthusiastic, you were coming. He sort of neglected us. He didn't speak to us. Well, I'm not going. I'm not going to go. But I have another disciple, his name was Bhardaraj. Bhardaraj Acharya. And he is very poor. In fact, he's so poor that he goes out every day begging. Go to his home, you'll find his wife Lakshmi, she's there. And uh, inform Lakshmi that Guru Maharaj will be coming tonight. So they found, they found the house of Bhardaraj Acharya. And he was out begging. Lakshmi was so poor, they were so poor that she could not even come out and appear before them because she didn't have proper dress. So she spoke to them through the door and uh, she asked them, well, why, why have you come? Well, Guru Maharaj is coming 
for lunch tonight and he wants you to make all arrangements. And she was thinking, oh my God, what can I do? And then she thought, oh, well, these two boys are here. I should at least offer them something. So she offered them each a glass of water and a place to sit. That's the best she could do. And now she's thinking, Guru Maharaj is coming. We don't have anything. How are we going to honor a spiritual master? And then she had an idea. She would sometimes go to this one grocery store when they had some, when they needed to get something. And the grocer, he was quite licentious. He would always lust after Lakshmi and always try to entice her. And she was never interested in him. So now she thought, here's an opportunity to cook nicely for my spiritual master. She went to the grocer and she said, I have my spiritual master is coming. Please, can you fulfill my order? I want all of these items and I promise I will satisfy all your requests. Oh, the grocer got so enthusiastic. Ah, she's finally surrendering. Good. And so he said, yes, you take some ghee, take some otter, here's some nice rice, vegetables we have. And he gave her everything she asked for. And then she went home. And that day she started to cook. Her husband came back before everything was over. And then she explained the Guru Maharaj is coming over. And uh, so um, he was shocked. The Guru Maharaj is coming. We don't have anything. But then he looked and she had cooked this wonderful feast. He said, my dear Lakshmi, my dear wife, where did you get all that? And then she bowed her head in shame and was afraid to respond to his request. But then she told him everything. He said, actually, you, you, are, you are very, very wonderful. So yes, um, go to him when the time is right. So that night, Ramanujacharya came and she offered him this huge feast. <laughs> so nicely prepared. And then Ramanujacharya was eating the feast and he could understand something was different simply by tasting the food. And then he actually said uh, to Bhararaj, how is it your wife was able to cook such an, you don't have anything. And then she explained everything. When Ramanujacharya heard her explanation, he thought of an idea. He said, all right, you go to him, but tonight after I leave here, you take this, and then he wrapped some of the remnants of his prashadam in a little cloth, and he gave it to her. He said, you give him this when you go. And then uh, he was satisfied very nicely. They had served their spiritual master very nicely. He gave them all blessings and benedictions. And then he left, and then she went to see the grocer. Ah, she's come, the grocer was thinking. And then she came very humbly, and she said, oh, thank you for, you supplied so nice ingredients for my spiritual master's evening meal. He was so happy, he wanted to give you some of his remnants, so here. And so he, she opened the cloth, and she gave him some remnants. And, he immediately started to take. And as he was taking the remnants, something was happening. His mind was changed. He started to actually shed tears and cry, and he started to feel really bad that he had tried to entice her due to his own selfish and lusty desires. And he said, actually, you are like my mother. You are, you are truly the... Uh, uh, blessed by Lakshmi Devi herself, you are so chaste, you are so faithful. Therefore, uh, please come and take anything else from my stores you want, and you may go back to your husband immediately. And so, just by taking the remnants of Ramanujacharya, 
<laughs> this um, lusty grocer was changed into a, a humble, a humble Vaishnav, <laughs> not Vaishnav, but a humble, humble personality. <laughs> he became purified. So there are three kinds, there are three very powerful substances that exists within the Vaishnav culture. And that is the water that washes the feet of a pure devotee, the dust that comes from the feet of the pure devotee, or, and the remnants of foodstuffs that are offered to the pure devotee. So that is called Maha Maha. There is Maha and then there is Maha Maha. That is an actual terminology. It's not just something we made up. Maha Maha means that Maha that's been first offered to the Lord and then given to the spiritual master and the remnants of that becomes Maha Maha. And as it says in the shape, I'm sorry, in the nectar devotion, it is so powerful that one can become fully purified by taking the remnants of a great soul. <laughs> and so uh, you can see the power of that. But from this little pastime, we learn how important it is to, to honor and respect all devotees. Ramanujacharya refused to go to the house of Yogesh. Uh, and uh, Yogesh waited, waited and waited, and Ramanuja never came that night. And then he was wondering what happened. And so he sent out his servants to find out more why then the Ramanuja didn't come. And then he learned from Ramanuja's disciples why he did not come. And he was feeling so bad. So to serve only the spiritual master and to forget the rest of the disciples and the rest of the devotees is called Prakrita, Baj Prakrita uh, Bhakta one who's on a very uh, lesser or a very neophyte platform of devotional service. Therefore, one should see that all devotees are worth, uh, are the objects of service. And one should treat all devotees, one should treat all living entities in such a way that you can do something for them that will uh, further their happiness in Krishna consciousness. Something, some seva. So this is a very uh, important story and also uh, the story of faith in the Guru and personal self-sacrifice by Lakshmi Devi. Mahapurna told Ramanuja, go to Gostipurna. Gostipurna has a special mantra. And this mantra is very powerful. Ask him to initiate you into that mantra. So in order to go to Gostipurna, he had to travel quite a distance. So he did. After approaching Gostipurna, Gostipurna said, this mantra I don't give out. So don't ask. <laughs> so he left. The Mahapurna was very enthusiastic. And he said, you keep going until he gives you the mantra. So this happened 18 times he went. And each time he was refused. Only on the 18th time, Ghosty Purna said, I can see that you are very determined and very qualified to receive such mantra. But you have to understand, I will give you this mantra, but this mantra is so powerful. And anyone who chants it can immediately become liberated. But you don't tell this mantra to anyone. It is a secret mantra. And it is, uh, if you tell anyone, then you will be condemned. So he gave the mantra to Ramanujacharya. And the mantra was, Om Namo Narayanaya. Om Namo Narayanaya. Om Namo Narayanaya. 
So Ramanujacharya was thinking, wow, I have this very powerful mantra and people can become liberated. So that same night after receiving the mantra, he went into the town where, he, where Ghosty Purna was residing and he called all the townspeople there. He said, please come and meet me at seven o'clock by the temple tonight and I will give you a mantra that will liberate everyone. So many of the townspeople came to hear from Ramanujacharya and he spoke the mantra to everyone saying that this mantra immediately gives you a liberation. When the news got back to Ghosty Purna, he was furious. He called for Ramanujacharya. Ramanujacharya came, fell at his feet. He said, you called him various names. You disobeyed my orders. You gave out this mantra. You are, you're going to hell. And uh, Ramanujacharya, after being chastised by his spiritual master and accepting it in a humble way, he said, actually, Guru Maharaj, if, if my going to hell is the price of giving liberation to all of these people, I am more happy to go to hell. He spoke with such sincerity and such feelings of devotion that when Dosi Purna heard that, he went right to his heart and he actually fell to his knees and started to offer obeisances to Ramanuja and saying, actually, you are my spiritual master. And he apologized and in so many ways he, he uh, he said, uh, yeah, he glorified Ramanuja for his compassion upon the fallen souls. That's a beautiful story. We went to that town. I can't remember where that town was. We were traveling in South India and uh, we had been visiting many places. And we went to this town where Ghosty Purna had given that mantra. And we also saw the church. <laughs> but it was, it was like a yeah, it was a church and that wasn't a temple. Uh, Ramanuja appeared there and from the top of the church, he spoke the mantra. I'll tell a couple more stories. And there's one that is very um, important for us to learn as devotees. It is foundational for the execution of devotional service. There's two actually. The life of Ramanujacharya is filled with great messages that we can apply in our Krishna consciousness. Out of all of the other sampradayas that are there, Ramanujis are very much into the mood of complete surrender and complete devotion and, uh, and in the mood of Vaishnav Seva. So Ramanujacharya had a nephew and his name was uh, das Dasarati. Now Dasarati was a great scholar. I mean, he knew the Vedas really well. He was expert at debate and uh, you know, he, he had a small following of his own. Um, one day, uh, Ramanujacharya's niece came to her and she said, oh, uncle, I have a problem. She was in so much distress. I just got married and my mother-in-law, she is so mean to me. She makes me work so hard. I, she, she sends me to the river to get buckets of water and it's very heavy to carry these buckets. And then I have to cut the wood and I have to build a fire and I have to cook. She's just working me so hard and I'm so, so tired and I'm not able to do much. Please, can you give some suggestions? Ramanujacharya said, you go back and continue to serve and I'll, I'll do something. So, Right around that time, uh, Dasarati, he had come to uh, 
Ramanuja, and he said, Ramanuja, my dear uncle, uh, this verse from the Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharma Pariksit Jam Mami Kam Saranam Puja, Aham Tvam Sarva Pape Vyo Moksha Yishyami Masucha. Can you tell me the meaning of that verse? Um, Ramanujacharya said, I will tell you the meaning, but actually, I want you to do a particular service. Your cousin, and she just got married, and she's having much distress in trying to maintain her husband. Her mother-in-law is making it work hard. So go, go to her and assist her, help her with cutting wood, carrying buckets of water and cooking. But Dasarati, the great scholar, he went. And then he explained to his cousin, and she said, oh, Guru Maharaj sent you. Thank you. And so he was helping out. And he was doing all the menial labor, and it became very easy. And the mother-in-law didn't find out. But anyway, he did everything. And the girl was now no longer in distress. And one day, after he had finished his business that day, he was walking. They came to a little group of people who were circling around one man, and one man was, was speaking in the middle of the circle, and he was addressing the crowd, and he starts speaking philosophical teaching. So Dasarathi stopped to listen to see what the man was saying, and the man was speaking, and then Dasarathi was listening, and knowing the scriptures very well, he understood this man doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> He, he presents himself as some scholar, but he doesn't know. And so uh, he, he started to indicate by his facial expressions that what he was hearing was not nice and it was wrong. Now, this man who was speaking, the scholar, he noticed this person, Dasarati, was indicating by the way he was reacting that he didn't like what he was hearing. So immediately he turned his attention to Dasarati. Now Dasarati is all dressed in work clothes. He's just come back from serving his, his cousin. And so he says to him, oh, you you're think you know more? Well, let me hear your interpretation of what is being discussed. And Dasarati started to speak. And when he started to speak immediately, not only the scholar, but the whole crowd started to listen very carefully. And he gave a beautiful explanation of what was being discussed. And everyone was amazed and they started to glorify him in different ways. Even the scholar, the scholar said, wow, why? that was amazing. I never heard any interpretation like that, but I can understand it's perfect. But I can see you're just an ordinary worker. You're just working like a laborer. Who are you? What is your name? He said, my name is Dasar. You are Dasarati, the Dasarati, the great scholar? Yes. Well, how is it? You're doing menial labor. What is this? He said, this is the instructions of my spiritual master, Ramanujacharya. I'm simply following his instructions. <laughs> and then when he went back to Ramanujacharya, Ramanujacharya said, now you understand the meaning of that verse? <laughs> oh, yes. Whatever the spiritual master wants, that is Sarva Dharma Pradiksa Jam, Mame Kam Saranam Bajam. Aham Tvam Sarva Pape Vyo Moksha Yashyami Masujaha. Krishna is telling us to, to surrender, but he's telling us how to surrender through the, his representative, the bonafide spiritual master. So one who agrees to serve according to the directions and instructions of the spiritual master is surrendered. Many times we engage in devotional service and we just do whatever we like and we call it devotional service. And that is nice, and it is devotional service. But if we are asked by the spiritual master or by the representatives of the spiritual master to serve in a different way or in an additional way, 
and, and we refuse, then we are not surrendered. One should be ready to do whatever is required in order to please the spiritual master and engage in devotional service. That's how Ramanujacharya taught that through Dasarati by putting him in a situation where he was just doing the service as a menial worker. <laughs> and I'll tell one more story. This story is really nice. <laughs> um, one, I think his name, I can't remember his name. He was actually another relative of, of Ramanujacharya. He came to see Ramanujacharya and he had a question. And he said to my dear uncle, I have this question. What is your question? Can you explain or tell me what are the what are the characteristics of the true Vaishnava? What are the characteristics of the true Vaishnava? Ramanajitarya thought for a moment, he said, actually, you should go to Shaila Purna. He's in Tirupati. You go there and you Ask him. Ashada Purna was maintaining the deity nicely in Tirupati, and he was uh, practically by himself at the time. So he went, it was a long distance. <laughs> it took him a month to get there. Finally, after reaching Shaila Purna, he came, he was able to speak to Shaila Purna. Shaila Purna said, Yes. You've come, yes, I have a question. What is that question? Please, uh, I've been sent by Ramanujacharya. The question is, what are the characteristics of a true Vaishnava? Shalapurna didn't say anything and simply walked away. <laughs> no answer. And then uh, this devotee decided, well, I should stay maybe. And let's get some association. Maybe he'll answer my question after some time. So he did. And he became a member of the devotees there. And he started to do menial service and doing whatever was needed. At one point, after being there for some time, there was a festival. And Shalapuna came up to him and said, uh, we want you to serve the prashadam in the festival. And so immediately, he, he took that order upon his head and became enthusiastic to serve the, the Bodhis Prashadam. After the end of the Prashadam service, uh, Shalapurna came up to him and said, you have a question? You asked me, what is that question? Yes. Uh, what are the characteristics of a true Vaishnava? Shalapurna said, the characteristics are four. One, he is like a crane. Two, he is like a male hen. Three, he is like salt. And four, he is like you. And that was the answer. And then he walked away. <laughs> now this person was feeling like he didn't really get the understanding, but he had no time to ask for the meeting because Shalapurna wasn't about to give the meeting. He just told him. So he left. After some time, he returned to Ramanujacharya. He spoke with Ramanujacharya. He asked him, did you get your answer? Yes. What is the answer? Well, I, he, I got the answer, but he doesn't. I don't understand the answer. What is the answer? Well, Shalapurna says, a true Vaishnava is like a crane. He's like a male hen. He's like salt and he's like me. Oh, okay. Ramanujachari immediately could understand. A crane. What is a crane? A crane is a, a bird who has long legs, stands on one leg and he stands by the river. And as the fishes uh, float by, he looks to see the big fish. The big fish is coming. He lets the little fish go by and then he grabs the big fish. And when the river becomes crowded or over flooded, he leaves that area and goes to the ocean. 
So a devotee will always uh, seek the uh, essence in devotional service and let the, the small things go. They will always seek for the benefit in devotional service. They always want to understand things accordingly from the spiritual teachers. And uh, when the river starts to flood, that means when too many materialistic people come, then the great souls, they leave and they go to another place to do their bhajan. Okay, now male, male hen, what is a male hen? Well, a male hen will go to a dirty area where there's been th food thrown and he will look through that area to find some seeds or some pieces of corn or something and he will pick them out and he will bring it to his little ch chickens. So he goes to the most dirtiest places and finds some edible foodstuffs and takes it out. So uh, a, a devotee sees the best in everyone. He passes by all of their uh, so-called uh, errors, mistakes, faults, and seeks the essence. He always sees the good in everyone. <clears throat> Um, salt. Salt. Mm. Salt makes the food taste. When there's food without salt, the food doesn't have much of a taste and everyone seeks after the salt. But if the food is cooked nicely, everyone says, oh, the food tastes so good. They praise the food. They praise the cook. They never praise the salt, although the salt is right and makes everything nice, the salt doesn't get any attention or praise. So in the same way, a devotee will do so much service, but always stay in the background, not looking for any honor, recognition, or any kind of uh, uh, well, praise for their activities in devotional service. They humbly serve without asking for anything. So they're like salt, they remain hidden. And the last one, you, and Ramanujacharya said, yes, and you stayed there and you did so much service and then it was time to serve for the big feast, you immediately served. So you surrendered your life to staying there and serving Salapurna. So that's a devotee, devotee, he wants to serve in any and all situations. But even this is a nice little pastime which illustrates some of the characteristics and qualities of a true Vaishnava. We learn a lot from Ramanujacharya. There are many, many other pastimes of Ramanujacharya. He had one very powerful uh, and very glorious disciple named Koresh. Koresh sacrificed his own uh, sight. Well, that's a whole other story in the life of Ramanujacharya, how one king, Kolatunga, <clears throat> wanted to establish uh, Shiva worship as being the religion of the area, but he knew that Ramanujacharya was there, so he made a plot to kill Ramanujacharya. So that plot was um, one of the ministers of Kolatanga had formerly been a member of Ramanujacharya's uh, uh, group. And so he was explaining the glories of Ramanujacharya that if you really want to establish Shiva, then you have to eliminate Ramanujacharya, otherwise you will not be able to do it. So Kolatanga sent some of his men to the, towards the camp of Ramanujacharya. The word got out that they were coming to bring Ramanujacharya and have a, a debate. Now Kolatanga's pro program was to have a, a scholar, a Shivite, debate with Ramanujacharya. And if Ramachun, Ramanujacharya lost, then of course Shiva, Shiva, Shivaism Shivaism would be established. But if Ramanujacharya won, then Kolotanga was planning to kill him. 
That was the plan. So when the word got out and that this king was coming, it was going to challenge Ramanuja to a debate with a scholar. Uh, it became an alarm because they knew that they couldn't trust this king. And so Koresh, he came to Ramanuja Chari and he said, give me your sannyas clothes. I will go on your behalf. So he did, along with uh, Mahapurna. They both came. Mahapurna was quite old. And he debated the scholar and he defeated him. And therefore, um, uh, Kolatanga was going to kill him. But then he remembered that Kolatanga had a daughter who at eight years old was haunted by a ghost. And Ramanujacharya had saved his daughter from the ghost by getting rid of the ghost. And so feeling a little bit inclined to Ramanujacharya, he did not recognize that it wasn't Ramanujacharya. It was actually Koresh. They actually quite looked similar and the clothes were now Ramanuja's clothes. So rather than killing uh, Koresh, he blinded him along with Mahapurna. And he told his, his servants to take him out in the woods and leave them there. So they did that. And then uh, they were there. And then um, they were trying to find their way back to Ramanujacharya. They were blinded. But um, Mahapurna was old and he was getting very weak. So he actually said, you go, I'm going to stay here and give up my life. So he, he gave up his body. And then, uh, as is described, um, Koresh was trying to find his way back and he was helped by some pilgrimers. I forgot who it was. It's described in the story. And then they brought him back to Ramanujacharya. Um, Ramanujacharya was overwhelmed with compassion when he saw what his disciple had done to save his own life. So after some time, uh, of course, Ramanujacharya had established the worship of Bhargaraj. And so one time he said to uh, Koresh, he said, Koresh, I think you should go to Bhargaraj and ask him to return your eyes, your eyesight back. You go. So Koresh left, went to the temple of Bhargaraj came in front of the deity and just sat there and didn't say anything. Bhargaraj, the deity, actually spoke to him and said, you have come? Yes. Why? And then uh, he didn't say anything. He said, he just sat there. And then after some time, he left. And then he came back and Ramanujacharya said, did you ask Bhardaraj? Well, no. Why? I don't want to ask anything for myself. Ramanujacharya was thinking, how to benedict this person who is such a great personality, such dedicated. He said, you go back. And again, you go to Bhardaraj. And you tell him that uh, you've lost something that belongs to your spiritual master and if he could return it. Okay, so he went back and sat there. Again, Bhardaraj noticed him. Um, I mean, yeah, and then he spoke. He said, you've come? He said, yes. Why? I lost something that belongs to my spiritual master. What is that? His eyes, okay. And so instantly, Bhararaj restored his eyes back. And then uh, he, he was again, you know, able to see. So Ramanujacharya had to trick him by saying that, well, you don't want to ask for yourself, but you understand that the, the body of the disciple belongs to the spiritual master. And therefore, because it's my property, you should ask for my property back. <laughs> so Ramanujacharya very nicely tricked him. 
So the life of Ramanujachari is um, Koresh, also Koresh is really, he was a Grihastha, he had two children. If you go to South India, you'll find that, um, oh, I left out one thing in that particular story. Uh, when he was asked, what, why have you came? He asked him, uh, well, I've come, you should show your mercy to this, this king called the Tonga, the Shaivite king. And uh, Bhartaraj said, yes. He gave him, he said, give him liberation. And he did. He asked not only, not at first, he never asked for himself. At the same time, he only asked for uh, the king to have a benediction. So that was Koresh. There's a temple. There's one temple somewhere in South India in that same area of Sri Rangam, where it's the temple of Koresh, where he is actually worshipped as the main person in that temple. He was such a great personality. And there are many, many stories centered around uh, to Koresh. So these are a few of the pastimes of Ramanujacharya. If you go to Sri Rangam, you'll see that there is a deity of Ramanujacharya that is encased in the temple, in the compound in one of the areas there. Uh, we were there, and when you see that deity, you are amazed because it's not a deity. It's actually the body of Ramanujacharya that's been put in resin. And it's actually Ramanujacharya himself in a, in a, in a deity type form and he's sitting there and people come to take special, special darshan. And when I, when we were there, along with all of the devotees, everyone was amazed how lifelike that deity was. We were feeling in the personal presence of Ramanujacharya. So um, their teachings uh, are so powerful. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj, when he wanted to take sannyas and there was nobody to give him sannyas. He actually followed the tenets, the principles of sannyas as given by the Ramanujis. And he followed their principles. And that was when he initiated himself into the sannyas order using the principles used by the Ramanujis. Uh, we had many wonderful experiences there. They loved Srila Prabhupada, even the leader of the Ramanujis at that time, the, the Acharya, who was the present Acharya, glorified Srila Prabhupada. He glorified the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. He glorified the Vaishnavas. Uh, and so we have a nice connection with the Ramanujis. And they are very uh, inclined to devotional service. Lord Chaitanya, personally, when he went uh, to South India, he stayed at Sri Rangam Temple and he stayed at the house of Venkata Bhatt, who was, uh, who was the father of Gopal Bhatt, who later became Gopal Bhatta uh, Goswami, Gopal Bhatta Goswami. The Lord Chaitanya came, he stayed there four months during the rainy season. And little Gopal was only seven years old at the time, but he served Lord Chaitanya so nicely that after serving him so nicely, the Lord blessed him. And after some time when he left, he was about to leave. Gopal was in anxiety that Lord Chaitanya was leaving. He said, but actually you can come and join me. You're still a young boy. You stay with your parents, take care of your parents. And when the time comes, please come and and stay with me in, in Jagannath Puri. So after many years, he joined Lord Chaitanya and became one of the six Goswamis of Sri Vrindavan Dham. <clears throat> so that was Venkata Bhatta. The house is still there. When we were there, we actually saw that same house. The house has been somewhat renovated, but it's the place where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu stayed. Across the street, there's a beautiful Jagannath temple was very unusual looking, but very attractive deities of Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra Maharani worshiped by Lord Chaitanya during the time he stayed in Sri Rangam for four months like that. Uh, 
Mm, Sri Rangam is huge. It has, it's a gopuram in the middle, surrounded by many small little temples within. There are seven boundary raw, seven boundary walls around the temple. And uh, it's more like a huge fort. <laughs> And uh, but it's um, each of the boundary roads within them, each of the boundary roads, there's small little temples there of different deities. There's the Sringadev, there's deities of Lakshmi, Narayan, and various other deities. And there's also the deity of Bhairaj is there, I believe. I believe it's Bhairaj is there. Or no, Ranganath, I'm sorry, not, not Bhairaj. I made a mistake, it's Ranganath. Ranganath Didi, Bhartaraj is in, is in uh, <clears throat> Kanchipur. This is, uh, this is Ranganath, the Ranganath Didi, very beautiful Didi. And he's in a laying down position. He has one arm uh, pointed towards his head and the other arm pointed towards his feet, which indicates that if you want to uh, take darshan of my Face first, you take darshan of the feet. <laughs> That's the way the pose is indicating like that. We approach the Supreme Personality of Godhead, not through looking at his face, but we always approach through the feet, gradually raising the eyes up to the smiling face of the Lord and back down to the feet. We offer our humble obeisances in that mood. The feet of the Lord or the feet of the spiritual master is the embodiment of pure devotional service. That's why we should seek shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord in devotional service because that is the perfection of life or that is the perfection of one's execution of devotional service. <laughs> uh, there are many books written about Sripad Ramanujacharya. One was written by Devaraj, another one, no, both were written by Devaraj, actually. Um, so there's many, many stories. And then he fulfilled that wish of um, Yamunacharya, where he named one disciple Parasaramuni. He actually wrote a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. And he also um, spread Krishna consciousness or devotional service, Lakshmi, Narayan consciousness everywhere. The Ramanujas worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead as Lakshmi Narayan, but they're also very inclined to Krishna. But they, their worshipable deity is Lakshmi Narayan. They are in the mood of Vaikuntha. Um, there's many, many, many stories. Um, and um, I think we are a little bit past the time here, <laughs> so we won't take too much time. Maybe devotees have other engagements. So we'll stop here and see if there's anyone that would like to maybe illustrate some of the points made or speak a little bit about their own personal experience if they have some connection in any way either personally through family connection or through experience with uh, the uh, Sri Sampradaya, the Ramanuja Sampradaya. Thank you, Marge, for such a wonderful class and sharing the glories of Sri Pat Ramanuja Acharya. Would like to ask devotees, those of you who have, as Marge requested, um, um, experiences or interaction with um, devotees who uh, uh, followers and uh, devotees of uh, Ramana Dutta please do share um, whatever you have learned from them. I would like to learn. I have never had that opportunity and blessing to be engaged with anyone. So yes, Anjali, Anasuya, <laughs> go ahead. I had to switch the name. <laughs> Hi, Krishna, Guru Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisance. This is all yours, Shil Prabhupada. Um, we went, I think my mother and I went on that tour with you, and I, I think we have the picture of those Jagannath deities in um, Sri Rangam. Oops. Yeah, do you have that with you now? <laughs> yeah. Can you, uh, can you post it and show it to all of us? Yeah, I'm trying to. 
<laughs> They're quite interesting deities. Yeah. Can you see, Guru Maharaj? Can everyone see it? Mm, mm, let's see. I think you might have to bring him a little closer. Uh -huh, yeah, okay. Uh, bring it up a little higher. Just a little up. There you go. Yeah, those are those Jagannath deities. They are very they unique, Maharaj. You're right. Yeah, they're very sweet. Very unique. Found it. Okay, good. We can see Baladev, we can see Subhadra, we can see Jagannath. Jagannath is blue. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, that was um, worshipped by Lord Chaitanya. And I think Marja Srimati said that um, she had something to share. I just made her co-host and gave her the... Um, yeah. Uh, we asked all the devotees to turn on their, their cameras for this particular discussion session. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance. as all to share for uh, Guru Maharaj, um, uh, thank you so much for the very nice class and nice pastimes. Uh, uh, remembering about uh, give a chance, you gave a chance to remember Sri Ramana Jacharya. But I just want to share um, a recent thing happening in India. Um, there is a big uh, statue built um, um, by the uh, disciples of uh, Sri Ramana Jacharya, and uh, it is unveiled by um, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, on February 5th. So I just want to share that picture um, with you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, you. I think all of the world, oh, wow. This is the big uh, picture, uh, I'm sorry, big statue. Yeah, it's named as Statue of Equality. Um, so this last Saturday, February 5th, uh, Narendra Modi unveiled. This is near Hyderabad, um, <laughs> just, I think 40 to 50 kilometers from Hyderabad. So this is a huge, uh, um, place where a um, lot big temple is built and uh, so the statue is unveiled Guru Maharaj. Yeah. and I think it's it was 216 feet tall right Shri Mataji? Yeah. Yes, Mataji? Mataji. Yeah. yeah there is a video wow. I'll share with the conference group Guru Maharaj. Uh, so there is a video where it shows um, the huge temple and uh, this huge uh, statue yeah, it's a nice. Everything is car carved so nicely. Yes, Guru Maharaj. He's got his chilak on his arms. Mm -hmm. Everything is nice. Yeah. Yes, I would be very happy to see that video. Sure, Guru Maharaj, I'll send it. It's a seven minute, eight minute video. Um, I'll send oh. it. Good. Thank you, Sri Ramanujacharya. Yeah, the Sri Sampradaya is very prominent, very devotional. And very much favorable to this kind, at least many of the leaders. That's good one, yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. That was beautiful. I watched clips of it on news, but thank you for really bringing it up today. Very, very nice. Any, um, yes, Mati, please go ahead. I'm sorry, Maharaj. Yeah, Srimati, can you send it to me on my email? Yes, Guru Maharaj, sure, I'll send it. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, Marsh, you wanted devotees to share whatever, you know, any experiences they had. So I'm just opening up the floor to devotees if they would like to share any of their personal experiences, uh, you know, with uh, followers of uh, Sri Ramnu Jacharya, any thoughts well, I would like to hear and learn. I've heard quite a bit from Marsh. I'm, I'm happy that I did. I'd like to anybody, hear from others. Anybody connected to... Sri Sampradaya through family. Usually we find it's always somebody's connected. 
through family lineages. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it. Yesterday we did Madhvacharya. We we got some connections there. Sri Devi is connected with Madhvacharya. Nice. I didn't know that. I learned something new today, Sri Devi Mataji. <laughs> that was nice. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share something? Maj, if if I could share a, a thought that came to my mind as he was speaking about the salt aspect of the pure Vaishnava and um, mm -hmm. what came to my mind was um, Bali Maharaj, our god brother, because um, he, that was his character, I felt, his personality in Gita Nagri at least, like, you know, um, he was the salt that was always hiding in this whole part of Sabji. <laughs> That was his mood. Without him, he, you know, mm -hmm. like like he was there, but not, you know, always in the background, but, but always made sure that things were moving, especially in the cow service. So that thought came to my mind as he was speaking about the salt. Perfect. I uh, yeah. yeah, I thought of that just before my class, but I didn't remember to speak it during the class. Yeah. He, uh, you know, and if anybody needed any help and any services or anything, he was always there to help out. And he was actually, we could say, Mr. Gita Nagari <laughs> in the real sense of the world. He was uh, humble, friendly, enthusiastic. And every day, I mean, as far as I remember, for years, he was dressing Gornitai. Every day. We're speaking about one devotee, for those of you who are not aware, his name is Bali. He just departed his body today uh, at um, 12, 19, uh, Eastern Standard Time. He was how old? He was in his 84, about? He turned 80 in November, Maharaj. He was 80? Huh? Yes, Maharaj. 80. Oh, okay. But he was still active in service. He was always still with the cows, still with the deities, doing other services. Yeah, when I go to Gita Nagari and I don't see Bali now, I'm going to think Gita Nagari is not the same. Our friendship goes all the way back to uh, the year 1994, Maharaj. 1994, yeah. In, uh, in, what is it, F Street, was it? Ninth and F Street, yes. Ninth and <laughs> F Street, yeah. Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Good old Bali. He, he was the mechanic who was fixing all the cars. <laughs> and he was an ice cream man. He would sell ice cream in his ice cream truck. Yeah. Everyone liked Bali. Nobody ever had any problem with Bali. Everybody liked Bali because Bali liked everybody. <laughs> Yes, Sri Devi, please go He's ahead. He's still dancing. I think when I came, I came in, uh, I, I came to Gita Nagari in November this year, last year, and then uh, I had a little kirtan. I think he was still dancing. <laughs> he, 80 years old, he's dancing away, you know. You want to say something, Sri Devi Mataji? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Anasuya. Please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. 
and all glories to Bari Maharaj. I'm just uh, remembering what a great soul he was, so kind, so gentle, so humble, and totally sold out to Bhakti Tita Maharaj, totally. He just was so devoted to his Guru Maharaj that it was amazing. His deep love, his uh, total surrender and complete faith in his mm. Guru Maharaj. It was amazing to see that, uh, uh, that depth of connection that he had with his Guru Maharaj. And I, I feel very inspired when I think of Bali Maharaj, the great soul that he was. So I want to offer my humble obeisances to this soul so that I may be blessed to get a few of those great qualities. Thank you, Sri Devi. That was so beautiful. Yeah, we couldn't have said it any better. Yeah, such faith in, in his spiritual master. That's what his driving force in everything he did. He knew Gita Nagari was his spiritual master's pet project. And so he gave his life to serving in any way he could in Gita Nagari. I remember Bhattacharya Swami used to tell us um, that um, uh, if you want to go back to Godhead, catch hold of Bali's dhoti. <laughs> Repeatedly, he would say that, catch full of Bali's dhoti. And then um, many years ago, I think this was, um, I want to say 97, no, 99, I believe, um, during the, the, when that was the first ever, I believe, I, I don't know, but the big Columbine school shooting. And when, uh, when uh, Maharaj came back from his trip, from his, uh, you know, wherever he was going in, and we had darshan, and he was very afflicted, and he was talking about how we should really focus on our preaching and then he mentioned he says that um many of you would not have come to me if i did not come in this uh, uh outfit but he said but if i preached to bali in a bathing suit he would have taken up the krishna consciousness <laughs> <laughs> bali was very 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 surrendered wow, and that, that, that's pretty powerful <laughs> yeah do you remember what, what year did he first come? <laughs> I think Pritchett will know the answer. Yeah. No, well, when did he join Krishna Consciousness? Right, Maharaj? Uh, he was already there. Pr yeah, he can tell you. Um, I came in 91, Bali was already there. So it must have been around that time or just before 1991. Before 91. Yeah, around 91. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's 1990. Because mm -hmm. I remember Maharaj uh, uh, Bhaktisattva Swami started this. Um, he was in a place called Ingraham Street before he came, moved to 9th and F Street in Washington, D.C. So it was around 1990. Uh -huh. So that's like 30, 32 years. Dedicated service. Never never complaining sometimes he would complain about not having the right tools to fix the cars <laughs> that was his only complaint <laughs> and then bali would go to the store to to get one piece of tool stool and spend hours and come back hours later <laughs> yeah he was really loved his tools to make sure he got just what he needed <laughs> Yeah, he was such a, I'm sorry, such, a, such a jolly person. He was always happy. He was an amazing devotee, an amazing, amazing devotee. Obviously, CC, Radha, Radha Damodar will take, them, take him to a very special place at their lotus feet. Very special. He was very special. Marge, that's a question um, that a devotee would like to ask. Uh, you can go ahead, Dar Krishna. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, <clears throat> please accept my humble obeisance. All glories to Shila Prabhupada. All glories to you. Thank you so much for a wonderful class on Sri Ramanujacharya. Maharaj, one question I have is kind of you know I'm looking for some advice. <clears throat> Sometimes we see uh, some of the devotees from Sri Sampradaya they come to our ISKCON programs. Uh, they really like it, and um, in my understanding, um, they worship. Uh, Lord Krishna in the mostly in the form of uh, Dwarka Dhish and Rukmani. Uh, they usually don't have much clarity about uh, Radha and Krishna. So how can we help them? How can we uh, uh, guide them or help them in the Krishna consciousness process without making any offense? Uh, the Ramanujis? Yes. Well, they're worshiping the Lord in there and uh, the form of Lakshmi Narayan or, yeah, or Rukmini Dwarka Desh, that's fine. <laughs> that's by Gunta. That's the spiritual world. We don't have to, they know about Radha and Krishna, but there's some Pradaya focuses on, you know, Lakshmi Narayan as the Supreme Personality of God and which he is. And if they, they reach perfection, they go back to the spiritual world, like from the planets. But they also, some of them have information about uh, Radha and Krishna. But they're not in the mood of Vrindavan, they're in the mood of Aishwarya Bhav. Vrindavan is Madhurya. Aishwarya means awe and reverence. They worship the Lord in awe and reverence. Um, I don't think we have to try to encourage them to change. That's not our, our business. <laughs> our business is to encourage them to, to become more and more fixed in their own form of worship. They're, yeah, they're authorized. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Sri Devi. I have a question, please, if I may ask Guru Maharaj, if you don't mind. It's about these four qualities of a true Vaishnav. At number three, you mentioned that you know, devotee doesn't seek any attention or praise. He just quietly, humbly stays in the background, steadily doing his service, never his or her service, never you know trying to um, seek attention or anything like that. This is a very um, elevated uh, state of consciousness. And uh, I'm just, uh, you know, wondering how, how it is possible to reach this uh, level of being so humble that you're never seeking attention, never seeking praise, never seeking anything. Uh, I mean, for myself, it seems like a very difficult uh, state of consciousness to attain. I have a tendency to want appreciation and compliments and encouragement and saying, yes, Sri Devi, you did a good job. That was good or something like that. And I'm thinking to myself, when and how one can attain this very elevated state of consciousness that one never seeks anything um, for that service? Well, the devotee who, who's developed that mood knows that Devotional service is complete in itself and completely satisfied in the mood of service, not wanting anything but service. Lord Chaitanya taught that. Manmani Jammani Jammani Ishwari, but no, not that one. Uh, I, uh, what is it? Ternadapi Suni Chena Tayori Vasa Hishnuna Amani Namamana Dena. Giving respects to others, not looking for any respect or recognition for oneself. One is feeling satisfied simply in serving. That's all. But in the neophyte stage, don't we need the encouragement of our senior uh, devotees and people? That's, yeah, that's what's called neophyte. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So how to progress, Guru Maharaj, so that we are not neophyte anymore? 
<laughs> that's the problem with neophytes. They, they mix in everything else. Um, but what we're talking about is very elevated. It's not easy because the last snare of Maya is to actually think that I am an incarnation or of the Supreme Personality of God. In other words, one becomes so powerful and so exalted in devotional service, one starts to think in terms of me. At that point, they fall down, at least if they continue to develop, keep that mentality. So this is a mood that one has to always be in to always remember that it's only by the grace of the Supreme Lord, only by the grace of the spiritual master that I can do anything, that I have anything, that I know anything. <laughs> the Bodhi always thinks, without the mercy of the Spirit, a devotee knows, even through the philosophical teachings in the Bhagavad Gita, that one, you know, we are just a small part of any activity that's performed. If you take it from a philosophical point of view or a practical point of view, you understand that before you can do anything, you, uh, you have to have the ingredients, you have to have the proper arrangements, and you ultimately have to have the sanction of the super soul to give the results. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Savasya Jaham Riddhi Sani Pastel, Matat Smirta Gyanama Pawanamcha. I give knowledge, I give remembrance, I, and, and, if, and I also give forgetfulness. When we understand things through scriptures and we work in that way, but the material world works in such a way as that people are looking for something, some comfort, something, some reciprocation for whatever they do. And the, even the most insignificant, just like, like somebody, somebody does something to you and he, it's for you and you don't even say thank you. And people, people will think, well, I didn't want anything. I just wanted to, I just wanted to be somebody to say thank you for, for what I did. But we don't even want that. The devotee is happy with the service. Krishna is pleased. What more can we? I remember I was at a program about a couple of months ago, and we were at we're in this one room and it was quite cold. And so I had my I had a real heavy charter that I was carrying and I was keeping warm with the charter. So there was one girl. She had a just had a little blouse on with some short sleeves, and she was doing some bhajans. And I could see she was cold. So I offered her my charter and she immediately accepted it. Graciously, she accepted. No, she, did, she took my charter. And then after some time, I said to her, you can keep it. So I gave her my charter. And uh, she wore the charter. And when I asked her, said to keep it, she didn't say anything. She never said thank you, never said anything to acknowledge anything I did. She just accepted what I gave her. And then I was thinking, hmm, not even a thank you. <laughs> but then I thought, well, if she's happy and if she's warm and she likes the charter, that's good. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> and it was just funny because, you know, about... A few days later, when one of her friends who was also there came to the Sunday feast in Ljubljana, and she brought, she gave me a box with a present in it, and I opened it up. It was a scarf. <laughs> it wasn't exactly a charter, but it was something that had the same same purpose as a charter. So I was thinking, yeah, all right, Krishna, thank you. <laughs> 
So yeah, if we want, we expect that and people expect that too. The Lord Chaitanya says, no, you shouldn't expect that. To simply be, be happy with the service. But in the material world, recognition is very, very strong. It's even stronger than sense gratification sometimes. That. Because Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati says, Pratishta or fame is the last snare of Maya. Fame, to want to be known for whatever you do in devotional service, to get to want some credit, to want some eulogies, to want some reciprocation, anything. But the reciprocation is in the bhakti itself. Bhakti itself is satisfying. One who serves finds happiness in the service and not so much in the results of the service. Well, you have to practice that. So then basically we have to be very, very um, humble and prayerful and, and pray to the Lord to remove all these things which are not good for our bhakti and will be stumbling block for us to really develop uh, true Vaishnav attitude and mood of service. Does yeah. that go yeah, about if you, it? Yeah. If you see that you're doing things and you're not getting any, any recognition, that means Krishna is purifying you from that attachment. <laughs> And, and then when you don't want it, you get it. <laughs> uh, I know one of his senior devotees, we were together, we were doing a lecture and he was telling a, a personal experience. He was asked by the GBC body to become a member of the GBC. And uh, he gave so many reasons to the devotees when they were talking to him, why he didn't want to take on the responsibility of GBC. And then they left and they had a discussion and they came back and they said, we consider you one of the most worthy candidates for becoming a GBC because you don't want it. <laughs> Because, I mean, that's a prestigious position in the society. But he didn't want it. And because he didn't want it, they gave it to him. <laughs> he was qualified to take it in the first place, but he gave many reasons why he shouldn't take it. <laughs> so, yeah. If you're grateful, to whatever happens, then you're happy. But a person who's expecting recognition and doesn't get it becomes unhappy and they cannot appreciate what they have because they're always wanting more. So we have to practice that. And that's not something that is so easily developed practice being detached from the results of your activities. This, the scriptures say, praise and blame. Uh, there are difference only in name, that's all. Praise and blame are difference only in name. That's all. Whether you blame or praise, it's the same, because it has nothing to do with you. It, it pertains to your body. But it's nice to glorify other devotees. And it's not, Krishna also does that. But the devotee starts thinking that I deserved it or becomes proud you receive such recognition, 
and then that blocks their progress in spiritual life. And if it continues, then Krishna will create a situation to remove that. And sometimes that's not so pleasant. <laughs> Very nice question, Sri Devi. Thank you so much for asking that. And I want to thank Guru Maharaj for explaining so nicely how to overcome this tendency. Mm -hmm. Guru Maharaj. Yeah, I'm working on it myself. I have to really work on that one. That's a tough one. It's easy to give up sense gratification, to give up you know, wanting to be recognized, or reciprocated, very, very difficult. But we have to remember our position. And then if we do, then we will you know, we have to learn to become satisfied just by serving. Thank you, Maharaj. Any questions from devotees? Any other questions, any comments that would like to ask, like to share? And um, if there isn't, Marsh, 